Or at least the slides. <laughs> no, slides usually are. Uh, hi, everybody. We'll fill you in on some secrets of uh, speakers and technology. We usually finish slides at the event prior to speaking. So yeah, no, no finished slides. Slides are never finished, much like your product. How's everybody? Great. It sounds really awesome. You guys are really having a great time. Uh, yeah, I guess I have to, as the host, impart some energy to the crowd. We'll see how that goes. Um, I flew in from other places yesterday, so I'm really, uh, really cooking right now. Um, as per usual, uh, who, it's, who's here for the first time? Okay. Awesome. Yeah, let's get a woo. All right. Uh, I guess that was passable. Uh, if you haven't been here before, uh, I'm usually not prepared, and I haven't read Olivia's notes. Uh, this is Olivia taking a photo, which is important to note. Uh, do not take photos of the space. This is, uh, I'm not kidding, this is brand new, and it's, it's, there's, uh, I assume, some press and other things going around about that, so this is very uh, top secret. So uh, this is where I'm talking and killing time as I'm scanning for where I start. Food delivery, 6.30 p.m. Olivia goes upstairs for the welcome. Not the first page. All right, hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin Galligan. Uh, this is a New York Android developers meetup. We've been going on now for, what, five years-ish plus. Um, I'm the president of Touch Lab, which is a fancy little Android development shop that makes uh, super awesome things. We're getting into other things, which I will briefly talk about tonight. Um, so first, a few housekeeping items. Uh, again, the photography. Like, you can take pictures of people and sort of take pictures of speakers, but not like the wonderful vistas. That's kind of like where they're, you know, in the architecture. That's, that's the, uh, the goal here. Um, it was a hard stop at 9 p.m., and we wanted to have a hard start as early as possible, so we had time to take advantage of their wonderful drinks and visage before we all had to leave. Um, I think we're trying, did we find a place? Webster Hall? Houston Hall, sorry. Houston Hall, Webster Hall. Um, Houston Hall, we're gonna go down there afterwards. It's not an official after party. We're just gonna see if we can come into your tables and see what happens. Uh, keep your meetup apps on in case that does not work out, and we'll uh, call an audible. Um, who here does not know what Droidcon NYC is? Okay, that's good. I really wasn't in the energy level to explain it. Um, so we are absolutely positively sold out. Um, if you got on the wait list, we're going to release some tickets tomorrow, I believe, yeah? But it's a long wait list, so I, I don't know how it's going to go. But uh, we have the live stream for the first time, and the live stream is going to be on the web, it's going to be on the Android app, which launched today, and I'm going to share the link for that uh, soon. And it would be on the iOS app, except we launched it and got rejected because it mentioned a lot of Android things. No joke. <laughs> so if we have time to uh, redact the Android, uh, we'll see. But uh, who cares, right? So, um, yeah, if you want to have a viewing party of some type, if you've got, if you're at a school, if you're at a thing, Whatever, just reach out and we'll, we'll figure that out with you. Because um, it'd be cool. It's our first year doing live stream, so please help support us too. Because if this goes well, then future things can do live stream. And it's cool. And it's brought to you by JW Player, who has been fantastic to, uh, to give us the SDKs and the back end. Um, it's really cool. So next meetup, uh, October 19th at Facebook. Oh, and there's a live stream promo code. Did you send it to me? Squarespace Meetup, and that will get you a live stream ticket for less money than it is otherwise. Squarespace Meetup. Um, yeah, Facebook, do we, we probably don't have a theme. We never have a theme until like two weeks out. But you should come to that. It'll be cool. Um, thanks to September sponsor Squarespace, of course. Uh, Ed, Jessica, Blanche, and Marissa for coordinating with us. Um, to e props for slides and nachos. Okay. I was, is that a typo? What is it? Two e props for slides and nachos. There you go. Sorry. Yes. Well, there was no capitalization. I'm like, what? Well, you know, you're still throwing me off. 
yes, sponsor welcome at Bridges. Parentheses, two to three minutes, but however long you want, really. I'll try not. I'll. <clears throat> I'll try not to talk too long. So thank you all for coming tonight. Welcome to our new office. We've been here just about five and a half months, maybe six months now. And uh, we're really excited to participate in this. Um, we have a team of mobile engineers, about 12 engineers in total in two continents here and in Europe. And we have five of them here tonight. We got uh, in the corner there, Nick. Rob and Steven, and then over on that corner we have Swapnil and Bob. And uh, we would love to talk with you after the event's over tonight. If you've got any questions or just want to come say hi, uh, we'd really like to uh, hang out with you. Um, so uh, I guess without anything else, you know, thanks again for coming. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we're almost exactly on time, so let me keep this rolling. It's crazy. Uh, I, I was going to talk about something. I haven't done a lot of public speaking uh, technology-wise since kind of running Touch Lab, mostly because my days are not entirely taken up by coding so much as uh, everything but. But uh, I started it as a developer. Uh, I've been doing Android since 2008. The, before the phones came out, there was a contest, and I did it as a hobby. And I've been doing Java since Java 1. And my mom taught me to program when I was seven, right? So I'm like a developer who can also sometimes public speak. So I've missed it. And um, the last like real talk I gave was actually at DroidCon UK in, in November. I thought about that today. So today I'm going to talk about something that has been, um, for lack of a better description, my obsession for the last several months. Um, and we had planned on having this thing be launched at DroidCon, and then something else with the business has happened that I can't talk about other than to say, if you are looking for a position in some really interesting Android slash possibly iOS stuff, uh, and especially if you're looking, you're okay with a little bit of consulting to start, uh, we have some big things potentially on the horizon, but I can't talk about it. And I thought we were going to talk about that at the conference, but for not, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, this thing called Dapple, which is this weird uh, collection of letters that I will now explain. So, um, yeah, this is about me, blah, blah, blah. I gave this talk to someone, a group that was non-technical, and then today I tried to change it to be somewhat more technical. So it's going to be kind of a mess. This is about us. Um, Touch Lab, mostly Android. That's a pigeon with an Android head, obviously. I'm wearing the shirt. Um, Joy-Con next week. It is huge. It's going to be awesome. The line is fantastic. Uh, and the stream will be the best. Um, cool. So where to start? Uh, and the problem I had was, like, do I talk about what it is or why? So I'm going to talk about what. <sighs> Doppel is an Android-centric cross-platform framework. And before you, like, your eyes glaze over with cross-platform, just bear with me. Uh, it's based on this thing called J2OBJC, which is Java to Objective C, which is a very accurate, if boring, name. Um, it's tools to augment J2OBJC technology to expand the Android runtime and to provide common Android libraries that are tested and verified on the platform. That's what it is. Uh, what's J2OBJC? It's Java to Objective C, includes JRE runtime and some Android, but not a lot. It's just code, no UI. Sounds terrible, right? Right, of course. Um, that's what I thought. And then we looked at it some more after going through Xamarin and, and uh, what's the other one that was Java that they killed after Microsoft bought them? RoboVM and a bunch of other stuff, and obviously Cordova and you know, Bomb and React Native and yada, yada, yada. So, um, so, uh, so uh, it was run, made by this guy, Tom Ball, who was at Sun, apparently through the start of Java, Google since 2008. James Gosling, who was the, like the creator of Java, wrote about this guy on the page. He's worked with him. This guy is very smart, Tom. Um, here's the apps that Google uses this thing to power, right? We're talking inbox, all these things, right? They're very big ticket things. Here's the apps on their page that other people are, have made from this thing. And they're things you've never heard of. And they're really obscure. And it's a longer list. And one's from Yahoo, to be fair. I didn't put it in this slide, because why bother? But uh, that wouldn't make my point. Anyway, so why? It's hard to use. Uh, the J2OJC team avoids Gradle, Android Studio, et cetera. Uh, there's a Gradle project for this that's not heavily supported. In fact, is officially unsupported at this point, and it was kind of difficult to use. Setup of this whole thing is really difficult. 
Android report is shallow. There's no context. So if you imagine every library that requires Android context, would not work. So that's you know quite a bit, right? Um, so we did this. If you know what that is, Center of the Dragon. I feel like I put it in there and no one really got it. So uh, it doesn't matter. So expanded Android support, what does that mean? Um, we've implemented parts of the context stack. Uh, I would say, you know, in retrospect, I think the Android context as a paradigm was probably ill-conceived considering how, like, God object it is and how central it is to all these things. But it is what it is, right? So the SQLite database stack, uh, shared preferences, the local file system, and then threading, so looper, message queue, and handler. Uh, all this stuff was implemented in Objective-C like parallels, to, to lack of a better description, um, including the main thread, which is a long explanation of how that works. But essentially, we're like simulating it within the iOS environment. iOS actually has a very similar environment, as do most windowing systems. There's a main thread and background threads, very common, and you're used to it in Android. Well, every other windowing system is the same concept. Um, testing support, so Doppel specific annotations to help with your JUnit tests, uh, JUnit runner specific to help support Objective-C and Android context, kind of like Rebel, Rebel Electric, but much less scope because you don't need activities. There's no UI, there's no services, that kind of thing. Um, an ability to run JUnit tests visually in Xcode, which was critical to me. So you can debug through your JUnit tests and see what's not transpiling correctly. Um, yeah, so an ability to debug the, the transpiled code, which is readable but verbose, I'm going to be honest. So part of this framework is taking Android li libraries that you're used to and converting them to the Objective-C and then running the JUnit tests and building dependencies within Gradle that are verified and tested to work well. So this is the current list of what's there right now. Um, some better than others. Retrofit works 100% tested. It's 1.9. It's not 2.0, FYI. JSON has really aggressive unit tests. They're like 99.7% passing. I can tell you off the top of my head which ones aren't and why, but they're not that big of a deal. Um, Rx is actually works pretty well, but it's got a lot of memory cycles and the memory is different, so I need an Rx expert to figure that out. Event bus, DBRMs. If anybody knows me, I'm a DB nerd, so uh, those actually work really well. I'll talk about that in a minute. And a bunch of other stuff, threading queues, yada, yada. Um, that's all in this alternate world of Objective-C that you can use. So basic usage, separate your non-UI code into a standard Java module in Android Studio. It's like a lib and then a UI. Nothing fancy. Uh, your non-UI code goes there. Uh, you add your uh, Doppel parallel dependencies, which we talked about in the last slide, to Gradle. And then when you compile to Android, it uses just the normal stuff, the stuff that's out publicly. And when you compile to uh, Objective-C, it uses these massaged versions that work in Objective-C. Um, uses CocoaPods, which that's a future. Maybe we can make frameworks, but not right now. And then you run the translation. That's how that works. Um, basic goal is to share business logic. Everything below the UI and platform specific is shared. Uh, minimal impact on Android development time. That is like the critical aspect of this, which is I might cut myself short because I don't want to kill the rest of the meetup, but I go into a long diatribe about development efficiency and yada yada. Anyway, uh, why use Doppel? Shared logic, obvious. First few assumptions. Oh, I'm going to go to it briefly. Um, UI should be native. If you're using shared UIs, they're generally bad or the lowest common denominator. They're essentially not the best you can do from a UX perspective, right? Um, and the fastest way to build something is its native platform. By that I mean, if you're going to build an iOS app and you didn't use Xcode, you'd be crazy, right? Like it is obviously the fastest way to do it. Same thing with uh, Android. If you're going to build an Android app and you use like Vim, you're crazy, right? Like you would use Android Studio. Uh, so those are the assumptions you have to accept. So which platform takes less time to build for, right? And I would ask everyone, but blah, blah, blah. It's a trick question. It's uh, the, the second platform because the first platform you learn a whole bunch of lessons. You're building a product. You're throwing away screens. You're refining your API. You're you're running into architecture things that you change, yada yada, right? So the first platform takes more time. And this is also the fallacy when people are talking about, I don't want to build two native apps because it takes twice as long. It does not, right? So uh, in a reality situation, and I'm just picking numbers out of thin air, like this is your second platform compared to your first. And if you've ever built a startup app you know that this is like conservative, right? Like we, you know, we built apps where it took three times as much for the first thing and then 
then you're done and you can just copy the second thing, right? When does it take as long? Oh, sorry, I get it online. So the value of waste, you learn lessons in the first platform. Waste is necessary cost for value. It's two platforms don't cost two X unless you build them both in parallel and then you don't learn the lessons and you repeat them. Conceptually, right? This is conceptual. I know reality is a little different, but that's how it works. So uh, foreign dev environment is always slower. So imagine you're building a Cordova app or you're building a React Native app or you're doing whatever, right? This hash time is how much extra time you're probably going to spend using a foreign development environment. It depends on what you're using. And some people would disagree with me. I'm sure React people would. But they'd be wrong. And I'm the one with the microphone. So that's the assumption, right? Um, the red line is what it would have taken if you built both platforms natively. Um, but the costs are multiplied, right? So all dev is expensive as it takes longer. So the waste lessons you learn also take longer, which is the thing that people don't talk about very much. And that's the missed like variable in that discussion. Uh, dev tools not as good as Xcode and Android Studio. Libraries are far less mature. This is absolutely true in almost every context. Uh, community is much, much smaller. Shared APIs are lowest common denominator, so you can't have like the latest, you know, swipe view. You can't use recycle view on iOS. Do you know what I mean? So you always wind up with like the worst options. And then debugging and monitoring tools are either third party or don't even exist, depending on what you're using. So development is much slower and riskier because if you run into a situation where something's just not working, what do you do? Do you start over? Do you, you code some crazy plugin on both platforms? Like, where do you go? Um, so Doppel's goal is basically, here's your first platform, and then if like roughly this much is actually your logic, then all you're doing is wiring UI into a tested and, and very functional like business logic piece. Reality is probably more like this or maybe a little worse, I don't know. But again, it's my talk, so I can make it seem as rosy as I want. Uh, <laughs> but you get the concept, right? Um, key points, Java Android dev time should be relatively unaffected. If you are not doing anything esoteric with the Java or the UI you're building for Android, then your Android development time is basically unaffected. So you're building as efficiently as possible. You start on Android, you do your testing, your user testing, your field testing, and all that stuff until you get something you want, and then you wire in the UI on the Xcode side. That's like the concept. Um, iOS UI design and wired in Xcode. If you've ever tried to build a Xamarin app while trying to wire from Xcode into Xamarin cross-platform stuff, uh, it's just like it's not not very efficient. With this, you can like you can code in Swift in your UI layer. You can drag stuff around. You screw directly in Xcode. Uh, keep as much logic as possible in shared code. Keep your eyes dumb as is reasonable. Uh, don't forget risk. Blah blah blah. It's just about a lot of fud about how what happens if shit doesn't work. You know, blah blah. Uh, Dapol is less crisp because Java objectives here aren't changing very much. Um, you can use native tools in the platform, and if something isn't working on Xcode to your liking, you just code around it because you're in the native environment. So like whatever. So if you're two weeks out from release and you need to fix something, just fix it over there and worry about it later. Um, use it if you have a lot of business logic. Uh, you don't absolutely have to launch an iOS first, which is you know good for the Android crowd, not for everyone else maybe. But um, don't use it if you're mostly showing content, heavy UI, light logic. Uh, have zero patience and skill for sorting out, build problems, and your iOS devs might quit, which I've been told that they might depending on the environment. So uh, status, we're using it internally on apps. We have a Joy-Con YC app, which I mentioned was rejected. I don't know if you, well, I mentioned it earlier. It was rejected today because it mentioned Android in the app. But it works, totally works. Um, it's functional, but a little brittle in the tools, not in the actual libraries. So we focus a lot more on the libraries and the tools at this point. Um, working on tests, working really well. Oops, there's a memory cycle issue which is the, there's no garbage collector. It runs like normal memory cycles in iOS. So that's just something you have to learn. And if you're just not willing to do that, then don't bother. Um, it's usually not too bad. But when it's bad, you got to pay attention. And uh, yeah, we have these. All this stuff's working OK. Arcs code has lots of memory cycles. If there was a context to have the maximum memory cycle count, uh, they definitely won. So that's rough, to be honest with you. Um, public launch, will we drop kind? Nope. Um, Framework Carthage packaging option, much improved Gradle tools. Pretty good way to deal with memory cycle issues beyond what's there already. Um, yeah, and what else we got? So setup and usage, like I said, make a lib module in your thing and move your code into it. That's not UI. So we do all of our networking, storage, offline, syncing, threading. Everything happens in here and bubbles up 
into this only as, as minimally as possible. Um, add Gradle plugin dependency. So you've got like, let's say, I don't know, retrofits in here, and then you see retrofit in the special doppel dependency. And that's pointing at a special dependency specific to this. And they're all down here and tested and verified. And then you add a little config, it's not very much. Um, and then you do the pod file thing. And then, bam, you can call that code from your Kotlin code, save profile, or from your Swift code and say save profile with this extra change on the bottom. And that's it. That's how it works. Um, so some patterns we've been doing, like we actually, in the shared code, we have a presenter and then like a host interface, which you then implement from either platform you can pass in, which does callbacks out to the native side. Uh, works pretty well with best practices. You can test directly against the presenter, skip the UI. It's all great. I had that slide today at the last minute, so I didn't think about it much. Why Doppel? Shuffle Doppelganger. Why we dropped the E? Several Doppels trademarked. That's real easy. <laughs> Performance, again, I did this benchmark about databases in, in London. And this is the some of those databases I've moved over. And in almost every case, the iOS live phone worked better than my OnePlus 2 was working performance-wise. So that doesn't mean that it's going to be better across the board. But certainly, uh, I wouldn't think that this runs very slow. Let's put it that way. And then here's the info, doppel.co. All you can do right now is sign up with an email if you want to get more info or early access. If you want early access, go there, send your email, indicate as such, and we'll talk. That's it. Oh, and I was going to do. How do we get out of this? Really quick. I know I'm like running long. Sorry. I'm killing everybody. That doesn't matter. I was going to show you the thing running, but. Because you're never going to see this app in the App Store because they, they killed it. So let's see. Come on now. We had to reboot. So I lost the running em emulator instance. Well, whoever's up next, you can probably just start making your way up because I'm going to end this really fast. Yeah? Just make your way up. And as soon as this is done, I'm getting out. <laughs> All right. So. Yeah, as it starts up. So everything underneath the UI is running exactly the same as it does in the Android app. So when I do this, like it adds an offline syncing task that will then RSVP and all that stuff. It's all the same code, all the database, all the networking, but the UI is separate. So that is what it does. This will be open sourced also at DroidCon. So you can try out the DroidCon app with both sides and see how it works. Anyway, that's it. Woo! Okay. Thanks, Ken. Put it here. All right. Let me get out of here. All right. Okay. First, it's going to be Nitsha talking about uh, know your user. Use Firebase Analytics for audience tracking and targeting. Wow, we're way over. Sorry. Okay. All right. Can you hear me, or do I need the microphone? Yeah, microphone. Microphone? Am I better now? Come on. I'm so loud. Okay. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nitya Narsman, and today I'm going to talk about understanding your user. Um, I, I didn't understand the limits of my talk because this is supposed to be a teaser talk, and I'm really bad at teaser talks. So Olivia is going to keep me straight on time. Um, so real quick, let's get started. Uh, a little bit about me. I actually have kind of like a diverse background. I started off in research. Um, I talk really slow, as you can tell. I worked in Motorola research for over a decade. Um, and that's where I first encountered Android. So we built a lot of like next gen um, applications and services. But more recently, I've actually doing more development work in the full stack space. So I kind of work with lots of early stage startups to build MVP. And I'm really proud of some of the work we're doing in the advocacy space. So um, I co-organized the Google developer group in New York and the one in Hudson Valley, any members here? Yes. OK, so some of you know me. Um, and I'm really proud of some of the stuff we're doing to kind of get the next generation of people onboarded to learn Android. But shameless plug, uh, this is actually kind of like the teaser talk for a talk I'm doing at DroidCon. So if you are at DroidCon on Thursday at 4 PM, you know where you're going to be because I've seen all your faces. That's all I'm saying. There's also a live stream. I hope I see you there. Um, so before I start, I kind of want to get a, bit, a little bit of a sample of the audience. So a little bit about you. Ray, can you kind of raise your hands? How many of you have built an Android app? 
How many of you, keep your hands up, how many of you have actually um, been involved in monetizing it? How many of you made money off that app? Yes, all right, you're my kind of audience. Um, the other side, how many of you know what Firebase is? Yay, how many of you have actually worked with Firebase? Oh, awesome, so if you have questions, follow the people who raise their hands and, you know, it's a good way to start. So, um, I have 15 minutes to do a 45 minute talk. People who know me know that I talk enough as it is, so this is gonna be really tough on me. So my goal is really simple. My objective today is this. I can't tell you everything you need to know, but my goal is to excite you about this and educate you about uh, enough so that you'll go out there and try to explore more on your own. And of course, then you're gonna show up at DroidCon and listen to my longer talk. So the three questions, I'll have done my job. If at the end of this talk, you can go away answering three questions. What exactly are mobile app analytics? Why should you as a developer care about them? And how can you get started integrating something like this into your Android app? So let's start with the first question. What exactly are mobile app analytics? So this is a really nice quote that kind of really succinctly talks about the space. It's from Kissmetrics, who are one of kind of like the bigger players in the space. And it basically says that mobile app analytics is about converting ad budgets to app installs and then converting those app installs to repeated app usage and in-app purchases. Because we all know that money runs the world, right? So at the end of the day, if you build it, they will not come, so you need to go get them, and then you need to make money off of them. And if I kind of try to boil this down into a figure, this is actually my version of what this space looks like. In the red are all your managers and clients. In the purple are all of us, right? And so from the perspective of anyone working in analytics, the real thing is when you build an app, there's a certain amount of money you're gonna put into it to go and acquire customers for that app. And the whole idea is at the end of the day, those customers in turn are gonna generate revenue, which is the average revenue per user. And as long as the amount of revenue they generate is more than what you put in to get them, you're okay. Everyone understand the big concept? Simple, right? So now we got a slog in the bottom here, and our goal is really simply this. As a developer, the goal is to really understand what the strategies are in these three spaces and help instrument your app so you gather the data and can come up with the insights that help determine if those strategies are effective, right? So what are those strategies? The first one, how many of you have heard of the term user acquisition? Yes? So that's really how do you get more users? What's your strategy for getting users to install, download and install your app? Second is user engagement. How do you make sure that once they've installed it, they continue to use your app? And the third is, once they use your app, how do you know how to monetize the interactions they take? This is the big picture. We will not talk about all of this. But I wanted to put this out there so you know exactly how many different metrics are there that are really involved in making these decisions, right? And this is a really nice article to read if you find, want to find out more. And I kind of like roughly you know, put them into the groups that we talked about, which is acquisition, engagement, and monetization. How many of you as developers actually have looked at any of these? Oh, yay, all right, we got one. So believe me, in, I've been in this industry for like 15 plus years, I never looked at it, it was so boring, until May. And then I heard something and I thought, man, this is fascinating, and I started digging deeper. So this kind of brings me to the same question that you're probably asking yourselves. I'm a developer, why should I care? Isn't this the marketer's job? Isn't this like the data analyst's job? Why should I care? So um, I didn't, how many of you are feeling happy right about now? Because in the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna depress you. So kind of just keep that in mind, yeah? So the same article from Kissmetrics puts this, right? It says the objective of the mobile app developer in this space is to actually help evaluate all those things. And really they want to evaluate it in terms of understanding if the strategies you put in, can I get data that tells me if those strategies I put in for those three things are actually working, right? Now comes the depressing part, right? So why should you bother? So I'm going to throw a bunch of statistics at you. I don't know how many of you have seen these, but these were really depressing. Some of them are good. So the first one is acquisition, a huge challenge. Why? The good news is they're predicting that the mobile app business is going to be $101 billion by 2020. So we're all going to be buying houses in Malibu. Not so fast. The, bow, the, the other flip side of it is that right now we have 2.2 million apps on the Android Play Store. That means for every app one of you creates, you're fighting with 2.2 million apps to get user eyeballs on them, right? Not a really good ratio. All right, so somehow you kind of have really smart marketers. You finally got the guy to install your app. This is like every relationship you know you now need to keep them engaged, right? How do you do that? Depressing fact number two. I don't know if any of you have seen these, but these are really, really fascinating. On the left side, 
is a statistic that says that you're going to hit a ceiling in the number of apps that a user will actively use per month, and that secret number is 27. At when they hit 27, that's the maximum cognitive bandwidth a user can take, meaning over the course of a month, you will probably interact with 27 apps at most on your phone, right? What does that mean for you? Your app is now fighting with those 27 apps to get on his device and be used by him. More depressing, look at the other side. The other side says, among those 27 apps, how does the guy spend his time? Turns out the one most frequently used app takes up 50% of his attention budget. That could be Facebook. You all know who you are. And, or that could be email. It could be anything. But if I now take the top three apps that he uses per month, that's 70% of his attention budget. So now every one of us who writes an app, we're fighting for 30% of his attention with 2.2 million apps. Are you depressed yet? You guys have like, you're, you're just too happy. All right. Here's that, that was about engagement. Finally, uh, retention. How many of you have heard this term user retention? All right. Depressing fact number three. Have you, how many of you have seen this curve? This is stupendous. I don't know if you can see it, but basically it says the number of days since your app installed and how many active users you have left. All those curves are steeply falling. Within, seven, within three days, 77% of the people who install your app are going to leave you. <laughs> within a month, 90% will. That's not good, right? Which means that you're really now left monetizing a very small subset of your app, of your audience, right? This is the worst. Worst, worst relationship ever. Dating is better. So the key to success that they talk about from like the marketer space is it's really to get those users hooked during that critical three to seven period, that like first week. So you as a developer, your job is to instrument your app so you gather data during that time, learn what the user is doing, and don't take him off, right? We could do lots of things to take him off, but we won't talk about that right now. Finally, let's say you're all happy, Dory. Right? You're a hunky Dory. You, got him to install it, you're getting him to use it all the time, he hasn't dropped off yet, you need to make money. So finally, last statistic of the day, um, how do apps make money on the App Store? On the right side, you're looking at the whole app market, turns out 60% of apps, or 60% of revenue comes from paid apps. And you think, oh, in that case, I don't have to bother with analytics, you know, I get my money off the top and I can forget about it. Not so fast, if you look at the other side, that's actually from August of this year, and it's looking at how revenue streams across the various things change. So if you look at the blue part, blue is paid apps, purple is in-app in purchases. So effectively, you're seeing that the paid apps revenue is going away. In-app purchase revenue, that's the one that's going to make money for you, right? So now your analytics need to help you understand what's the most effective strategy for in-app purchases. Make sense? Yes? How many of you are bored by now? Yes. <gasps> Did you raise your hand? No. <laughs> Um, it was a rhetorical question. Don't answer it next time I ask. Um, so finally, we're going to spend the last bit of time on how you can get started. So now you know what analytics are, what the metrics are, you know why you need to kind of work in the space. How do you get started? So I'm going to actually talk about Firebase. Um, a lot of you are familiar with Firebase. To be honest, there are many other solutions you can use today to integrate to get analytics for your app. But I kind of want to tell you why I think it's interesting. So before I get there, let me just give you a brief um, kind of like view of what Firebase is and how it's evolved. It really started off as V1 as just a real-time database, right? That's all it was. It was a startup building a real-time database till Google acquired it and they converted it into a backend as a service. That was V2. And at that point, all they said is, if you're an Android user, an iOS user, a web user, you focus on your front end, we'll provide you authentication, security, hosting, and a database for your application state. You take care of the front end, right? So it was very developer focused. In May of this year, they unveiled this whole giant platform. And you can see that now what really is happening is it's going away from being just a development platform to something that goes through the entire ecosystem end to end. So actually supporting the other two needs, which is how do I grow my user, or how do I acquire users, how to engage them, and how to make money. And the core in all of this is analytics. I want you to think about analytics, Firebase analytics, as both the brain and the heart of your system. It's the brain because it's going to collect data from all of these. It's going to think about it, and it's going to reason on it, and it's going to come up with insights. It's the heart of the system because it's then going to pump those back out to help you make actionable things on all the various pieces. Okay? Um, it's free and unlimited. This is the marketing slide. It's free and unlimited, so no matter whether you're a small app or the big app, like you know a production app, it's going to be free for life, which makes it slightly better than some of the other options. 
And this is the most important thing. If you take nothing away, remember that the big difference between this and other analytics, or like, you know, at least when you think about mobile, is it's event driven. You get to collect user behavior data at the granularity of individual events, right? Which is way more fine grained than catching like page views and session information. Um, I personally like this for three reasons. One is, I only have to learn one platform and one API and one library. I don't have to like learn multiple things, so I could play with this sooner. The second thing is that whenever you think about analytics and you want to measure data to kind of like work on all the different metrics, and you work with five different tools, you become the data mule. What does that mean? You, it means that you've got to get the data from this guy, convert it into the format that's good for this guy, get the result back from him, convert it into the format good for the visualizer. You're just stuck in the middle. And here, the idea is that one guy maintains all the data. It's consistent. And finally, there's seamless integration with some of the other Google products, like BigQuery and, Big, and AdWords, that kind of complete the cycle, right? So let's kind of quickly get into how you would actually use this. So your outcome is really this. You have an app. You're going to instrument your app on the, in Android Studio to generate events. Those will get fed into Firebase, and magically, you get this. You don't have to work to get this. You just get this. And you can already see that you can see the metrics like engagement per user, daily engagement, you know, session duration, some of the metrics that we talked about before. So I'm going to just, because I don't have much time, I'm just going to hit on the highlights of some of these and just like enough to get you going. The most important thing in analytics is events. And the one nice thing is like by default Firebase, the minute you install it without you writing any code whatsoever, it's automatically going to be capturing these events for you. These automatic events are really some of the core events. Now you can understand, when did the guy install my app? Why did he uninstall it? Why, when did he see the notification about some new you know, like upgrade that I sent out? When did he actually open it? So all of these things you get for free. You can also, if you like, take advantage of suggested events. So what they have done, which I thought is kind of cool, is they looked at various domains, and they proactively identified event types that are most useful if you want to understand user behaviors in that domain. So if you are an app user who's working in that space, you have a list of events that you want to be able to fire off or log in your application. And in addition to these two, you can actually also create custom events. You can come up with a custom event that says, I'm going to post this whenever this kindergartner plays an audio song in the middle of his class as seen by the geographic data. You can do that, right? Um, how do I get started? It's really just three steps. The first step is you set yourself up. You go to the Firebase console and create a project. You go to your Android Studio ID, and you configure it. And that's it. That's all there is to step one. We're going to look at it really quickly. Step two, which is the critical part, is you're going to log events. And step three is you just go to the dashboard and look at the data. So set up. Creating a project at the back end is as simple as go there, put your project name, walk through the wizard, which literally walks you through getting a blob that you can put into your studio to actually kick off the integration, and you're done. That's it, right? You didn't have to write any code. Posting logging events, if you look at the last two lines of code over here, that's all you do to log events. You literally get hold of the Firebase Analytics of the class, get an instance of a Firebase Analytics object for a particular activity, and then you just call the log, act log event method, passing it an event type. You can create up to 500 custom event types. You can attach up to 25 parameters that provide context for the event. All of that goes up to Firebase. The other thing, and I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to like wrap up really quickly. The other important aspect is user properties. Think of it as attributes that, design your, that define your user audience, right? And the reason these are useful is that when you kind of look at the insights later, if you go to the dashboard, all the data that you've been logging just goes in there. You can look at crash reporting data, and you can look at user engagement data. And in there, you can go ahead and like do all these things, custom, like create events and user properties and all that. But this is one thing that I want you to remember. What really makes this a very interesting back end is you can identify audiences. You can basically say, I created those user properties and events. I'm going to create this notion of an audience, which is anybody who fits the profile of having these properties and having done these events. And Firebase will automatically subscribe every user from then on who satisfies that. You never have to look and do it manually. Now you have a target audience that you can send notifications to. You can do custom app installs on, et cetera. So 
I'm kind of running on, down on time. So I'm going to say a couple of things, and then we'll kind of close it down. The way you can do user audiences with users, you can also do funnels. Funnels is like getting a bunch of events together and creating a funnel. So you're really saying all the people who get out at the other end are people who've done this exact sequence of events. So you can think that's really powerful. You come up with a, a workflow. You want to see how many people follow my workflow, how many people fall off in the middle, how many people actually do other things in the middle of the workflow. You can find that out. All right. Yes, I almost made it. Okay. So if you learned nothing else, hopefully I excited you about analytics. The takeaway is why mobile analytics? Because you really want to understand your user's behavior across the spectrum. Why you should care? Because your app is competing with a million others. And you really want to use this data to make data-driven decisions in terms of all the strategies you implement for the first part. How do you get started? Go look at Firebase. It's kind of super interesting. Um, I'm going to, if, you, if you're interested, hit me up. I'll share the slides. But there are a ton of resources that you can look at from Code Labs. And uh, you know, this is a really good talk on analytics, step-by-step um, -step Code Labs that you can do on your own that will get you started. And finally, kind of my own little plug, we run the Google Developer Group in New York. We're having a Firebase um, event in, um, what's next month? October. <laughs> and we're going to do a Firebase hackathon in November. So if anyone is working in the space and is interested, come talk to me. I did it, yes. So thank you very much. Um, can we uh, post your slides up later? Or yes. Um, though that link should work. Okay. Um, but I'll post them up. I just have to Introduce unlock it because that's okay. all the pictures. I think it's only fair I do that before you guys see them. But otherwise, you're good. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Huh? Oh. Where is Eric? All right. Now. Really? Oh, so uh, how's everyone doing? There we go. Um, I don't really have a joke. I feel like as, as adult life, you know, comes in. Yeah. That's a good one. In case you didn't hear the, the statement from the crowd, it was the joke was my adult life from Dave. So you should all thank Dave on the way out for, for lighting the mood. Woo uh, you know, I, I, I wish the bar dude was there. I'd be like, all right, well, at least we'll take a bar break. Uh, yeah, Lisa, how do you feel about going suddenly right now? Because I don't know where Eric ran off to. Uh, you know, we don't want to. We don't want to bring down the, the energy level. <laughs> Everyone stand up. Do a, like a, a stretch. There you go. All right. So uh, Lisa is going to talk about radical recycle review, which um, actually I'm interested to hear. I have no idea what this is. Oh, the, yeah, I mean, well, recycle review, sure, but then everything else. All right, you ready? Let's hear it. Everyone wake up. There we go. All right, bye. Thanks, guys. Um, hi, my name is Lisa Ray. Uh, I work for a startup in Brooklyn called Genius. And I'm excited to be here. So today I'm going to talk to you about Recycler View because my talk next week is going to be a practical guide to implementing complex layouts in a recycler view. In a way, it's the talk that I wish I had seen myself before I started at Genius almost two years ago. Um, so you're probably wondering what's so special about recycler view that I want to talk to you for 45 minutes about it next week, not today. Um, <laughs> and the answer is it's really a question of scale. Recycler view is by far the biggest layout there is in Android. And by biggest, I mean that it's actually a viewport into a huge virtual layout. So a linear layout or relative layout can only contain as much content as the viewport. But a recycler view can contain five times as much, 10 times as much, maybe even an infinite amount, depending on if you keep loading content into it. It's getting there. Yeah. Um, and a recycler view introduces almost a whole new architecture for views. For starters, now we have this concept of an item. And it's not clear what it's supposed to be. It's not a fragment. It's not a custom view, necessarily. 
it's some compromise between what you would consider a logical subcomponent of the screen and a small, reasonably reusable Android view group. So you need to make that decision. And then there's this whole concept of view recycling, which is like another life cycle inside the standard activity fragment life cycle. So now your items, whatever the hell they are, are having a day like those guys in Mad Max. They live, they die, they live again. It's pretty weird, and it's unlike what you see usually in the view life cycle. So, my goal is that while well, your recycler view may be complex, and in today's apps, it probably should be, but your code shouldn't be. So I want to talk about making multiple view types, lots and lots of view types, and all the boilerplate of recycling pretty painless. Um, using references or groups of items so that you can modify your adapter without conflicts and without fear that you're going to get things out of order. Um, and then I'm going to talk about decorating. So that's a lot of custom drawing, everything from dividers to how to distinguish different groups in a list. I'll talk about animation. And then finally, I'll talk about how to use a recycle view to get responsive layouts through grids and custom layout managers. So just before we start, a very rough overview of the recycler view life cycle, just so we're all on the same page. Every view is going to start with on create view holder and on bind view holder. And then it's going to be recycled. And then it's going to come back. So it turns out these two, on create and on bind, are the only ones we need to care about because recycling is handled for us. I guess it makes sense it's called the recycler view. So when we get to multiple view types, these are the two things we'll be looking at that are going to make our adapter a mess. Right now in the Genius app, I'd say we have about 50 different view types. Um, that's a lot, but I actually think that it's not that uncommon in a complicated app. So the naive way of handling view types is something like this. It comes from the old implementation in list view where you're literally going to have a list of integers that increase by one, where you list out all of your view types. And every time you make a new one, you have to update this list. Then again, with the naive way, here in your adapter, onCreate is going to be a switch statement. And this switch statement is going to get really big, really fast. In each one, you're going to say, for the view type, this is my layout, and this is the type of view holder I want to create. And then on bind, you're going to have another switch statement. And in this one, I could only, this is a pretty typical on bind uh, for a very simple view. And I could only fit one of them on the screen. So this approach may seem fine at first when you have one list item and one header. But in another month, this is what your adapter is going to look like. So um, the first way I ever saw this approach, trying to move this logic out of the adapter, was with a delegate pattern. And it gets some things right. You don't want this on bind logic in the adapter. So with a delegate, your adapter ends up looking something like this. You register a new delegate for each view type. And then on bind, it just says, of all my delegates, can one of them handle this view type? All right, you take care of it. Um, but you end up having to register a new delegate for each view type. You have to update this. This is maintenance, and you will forget it. So that's annoying. We can do better. So, First of all, get rid of this list of item types. You don't need them. Uh, you don't need to say how many view types are in a recycler view. All you need is that they are unique. So we already have a nice unique ID. It's generated for you. So we're good. So I'm going to show you an example using a library I really like. Any Airbnb folks here? All right, I can say whatever I want. OK. Uh, it released a couple of weeks ago, and it's a really th well thought out abstraction for the general solution I was going to recommend for you anyway. Um, you don't need this library. It's not rocket science, um, but it's nice. So here's an example using the Airbnb epoxy library. And with that one, you're going to create an epoxy adapter. And then the items you add to it are called models. I've also thought of these as wrapper objects around my own database model objects, um, like a user or a song that I'm representing. So this is really simple. There is no setup, and there is no maintenance. There is no boilerplate. I can make a new header model and just add it to the list. So that's kind of what we're going for. And you can see that one of these model objects, the wrapper, itself is pretty simple, and it knows how to bind itself. Also, it knows what layout should be inflated. 
which is also its view type. So they get a sticker. The problem is that you still need a custom view or a custom view holder for each item. So we're getting there. This is another library which handles items in a very similar way. Um, so over the last two years, I've been working in parallel on my own version of something extremely like this. Um, and I'm making it public today in the Genius repository, and it's called Groupy. So Groupy handles multiple view types in a very, very similar way to Epoxy, which is probably why I like Epoxy so much. Um, but it was designed to do much more than that, and I'll talk more about that shortly. So because it's drawn from the Genius code base, uh, it uses data binding, so it eliminates the need to write view holders at all. You can see how great minds think alike. Whether you use a library or not, whether you make your own interface, I recommend a pattern something very like this. And I also recommend considering data binding. If you would like to have one view holder that looks like this for your entire recycler view, consider data binding. Um, if you've heard me talk about it, you know that it generates a class for each of your layouts, um, which has references to all the views with IDs in the layout. And that sounds an awful lot like a view holder. So you can see how it's awesome for recycler view. This one I took directly from our repository. All right, so we've got a lot of views, and now we want to move them around. So I made a little example, and I think this is pretty typical complexity and interactivity for an average screen in an Android app. So here you can click to see authors, you can click to see comments, and at the bottom are more ways you can reach other content. So the user clicks on view comments, but they're not loaded yet. We can see where they should go, and in fact, it's likely your click listener even reported the position of the comment header, which is at index two. So they go at three. So we go load them from the server, and wait, what happened here? Clearly, something has happened that's going to mess up our system. So if we put the comments now, at our saved index, that's wrong. We need to get the new index, which would be five, because two items were inserted. So the most standard out-of-the-box way to solve this is just to use references. And if we look at using a standard adapter, I suppose I'm extending recycler view adapter, um, we would do something like this. Get position isn't provided. But you can imagine I would use something like index of to find out where the comment header is in my list at the moment the comments come back from my server. This would now be five. And I'm going to insert after that. Sorry, four. And I'll insert after that. Then we finally add them to the list. And don't forget to notify. So this works. But what about when you collapse the group? Do you go find the index of each comment you inserted and then remove them and then notify? And then what about you expand it again? Do you put them back in? Where do you have this state of what the user has mentally for this list? So here's how it might work using epoxy. We'll start with the same header we had before. We'll keep the reference. But epox uh, epoxy is, was built to think about this problem also. So it has methods like insert model after, which make relative changes. So in this example, I'm iterating the list in reverse, adding the items in reference to the header. You notice we never have to ask the adapter what position the header is. So that's cool. And it also notifies for us. That's cool. Finally, it lets you hide and show content, which is still logically present. So this is really useful. All right. And so in Groupy, this is not a very fair example, because the real reason I wrote Groupy was to abstract away the complexity of groups. Uh, and handling the multiple boilerplate was more of a step on the way. But in Groupy, you can add groups of items directly to the adapter. You can mix and match them with individual items. And an expandable group is one of the classes it ships with. So you can imagine doing something like this. Simply add the items to the group and expand it. And that's kind of nice. You don't have to use my library for this. You could put this logic in a method in your adapter. But if you do this a lot, you're not going to want to manage adding these items manually over and over. Oh, and if you want to show it again, just toggle it back. 
Um, so why not just use our totally awesome library? Uh, it's not ready. <laughs> it's only been tested on scenarios in our app. It should be considered experimental. And I'm talking more experimental than constraint layout. Um, if I were to start a genius tomorrow, I'd probably consider building Groupie on top of something like Epoxy that's built by a larger team of engineers. But I want to get the discussion started, and I've also put all of the code from this presentation, plus all of the code from next week's presentation, into an example app in this repository. So in my talk next week, I will go on to talk about diffutil, where you don't have to know even what changed, it will figure it out for you. We'll talk about drawing, animating, and grids and flexible layouts. Thanks. I can take questions if we have time. Okay, Olivia. <laughs> there we go. That went good. All right. Uh, Eric, Eric's here. So uh, it's good. Let's hear it for Eric. Woo! Oh, it's the scroll performance. Okay, cool. Let me know when you're ready. Got a thing. Okay. Yep. There you go. Cool. I secretly wanted my talk to be after hers, but now I don't know. Maybe it would have been better before. All right, let's see if we can hide this. Let's just go away, right? Uh, should we not worry about it? I don't know. I don't know if anyone cares. It shouldn't be there. Well, whatever. Cool. OK, so my talk is about analyzing score performance. And obviously, Lisa's talk was just about RecyclerView. Uh, and the main thing you do in RecyclerView is obviously you scroll. So hopefully the two talks go, go together. Um, and I'm Eric. I'm an Android engineer at Tumblr. And I've been doing scroll performance for a really long time because the main thing you do in Tumblr is that there's a dashboard and you scroll a lot on that dashboard, maybe for minutes at a time. I don't know. So cool. So what is scroll performance? What is scrolling? Basically, scrolling is a, obviously a behavior that the user does to your app. Um, and like, th I mean, they're not just scrolling like, you know, the same way every time, like different users scrolling different ways, they may be scrolling up and down. So this was, is what makes scroll performance such a hard problem, right? Because basically, <clears throat> um, you don't know how they're going to behave, so how are you going to predict around it? How are you going to make it performant if you don't, if you don't know what you're, they're going to do? Um, the next thing is content. You're going to be displaying different content in different points in your recycle view or your, list, your linear layout or whatever. And different content is going to behave differently. It's going to have different performance characteristics, right? Sometimes you have to show, like, I don't know, a carousel inside your recycler view. And, like, I don't know, that's going to be a lot of work. And also different devices. They're users on really, really slow devices. And there's only so much you can do to make that performance good. Um, also, performance is different on landscape versus um, portrait. Like, I think users can scroll faster on portrait than landscape. Also, they can scroll faster possibly on a tablet and you have to render more pixels and all of that stuff. So part of the reason why I wanted Lisa to go before me was that I didn't have to do this. Um, basically, this is how RecycleView works. You create something, you have to inflate, you have to bind. Uh, it goes at the bottom. Or maybe if they're scrolling up, it goes at the top. Um, and then when it gets to the top, it goes into this pool. And then if you get the same view type again, it calls bind. So <clears throat> inflate and bind are the main operations. In your in your list, so how do you get better scroll performance? You have to measure it, right? Uh, well, so in in uh, Marshmallow, they came out with frame stats, and before that, they had graphics info. This is how they map to each other. Um, start uh, is basically where like this is stuff you do for some reason on your on your UI thread. I don't know why you're doing it on your UI thread, but if start takes a long time then maybe you want to work on that. Input is and animations are processing your scrolling. So basically, this is going to be a lot of the work that Recycler View is going to be doing. Um, your inflate and your bind is there. And traversals is like doing your layout and your measure pass. Draw is calling view.onDraw, sync, sending that information to the GPU. And then your GPU is obviously going to go and take that all that information and render it. Um, and on graphics info, almost the same amount of information draw 
is stuff that happens before it gets to the GPU. Um, prepare is the same as sync. And process and execute are like kind of like very like if you're if you're really into the Android framework, it's they're gonna it's like maybe it's important to you, but I guess a little tidbit is that execute is where your overdraw is going to be if you have issues with overdraw. Um, and this is basically like how it maps in terms of like where it's happening on your phone. Um, a lot of the operations on the CPU and then process and execute are on the GPU. And there's gonna be some amount of time transferring data from the CPU to the GPU. And this is important when you have like really large bitmaps. So in the documentation they say like if you have really large bitmaps like sync or prepare is gonna be pretty large. So, so I just showed you graphics info and frame stats. How does that map to SysTrace? Well, you have, your, your screen has to update every uh, 16 milliseconds if you want to hit 60 FPS. So that's perfectly buttery, smooth scroll performance. And like I was showing before, um, it happens on two separate threads. So rendered thread is what communicates with the GPU. And uh, the UI thread is like really your main thread, right? And that's where you're doing your drawing, the inflate, the bind, and all of that work. And you want to do this every 16 milliseconds. Well, what happens if you go over? Well, you miss the 16 millisecond deadline, and now it's going to be pushed to the next 16 millisecond deadline. <clears throat> so then that frame is just, it just, it's just going to draw the same thing or not draw anything for that frame. Um, it's not going to, like, just because you finished doesn't mean it's going to draw any earlier, right? The, the display only refreshes uh, every 16 milliseconds. I mean, maybe that'll change in the future with, like, I don't know, 140 hertz, like, displays or something. I don't know. Uh, so, so taking that same diagram, how, how does that look like in frame stats? Frame stats has this uh, green line. When you draw it on your, your phone, you, you can make it uh, display on your phone. Um, and you still have to hit that 16 millisecond threshold. And when you're over that, you're going to be late on drawing. <clears throat> OK, so this is what frame stats actually looks like on your phone. It's just a lot of these colorful bars. And some of them are over that green line. Some of them aren't. Um, another thing that's important is that if it's under the green line, doesn't mean that it's going to, you know, just draw faster, right? It's just, it's going to wait until that 16 milliseconds passes. <clears throat> and this is a histogram of what you just saw. It's a, it's a basically a count of like the slow frames uh, are on the, on the left. I mean, the slow, the slow frames on the right side and the fast frames on the, the uh, left side, and if you're over that 16, so you see here there's like, I don't know, six items that are over uh, 16 milliseconds, so six of these frames are over uh, 16 milliseconds. And the bottom, also important, is, is just a frame number. It's not a measure of time. Measure of time is vertical, which is main, maybe not what you're used to. But um, that measure of time is, a, is also kind of a measure of, of the amount of work that you're doing, right? If, you're, if you take longer to do this to do work I mean this, you probably had more work to do or maybe you, you had a thread that sleep in there for some reason I don't know <clears throat> so another way to visualize that same information is to sort it um, basically take all those frames that I just drew that was before is in the order of time that they were drawn and now they're just sorted in order of like how long they took from uh, the longest amount to the fastest <clears throat> and this is pretty useful because when you just look at the times rather than the individual uh, amount that each component took, you can see that the 50th percentile, so basically everything to the left, and if you take the average of that, now you can see that like, okay, your 50, 50th percentile here is going to be almost close to 16 milliseconds. <clears throat> the 90th percentile, I mean, you're over pretty much, right? And 95th, well, you just got one frame here because there's only 20 frames in this diagram. So this is like, you know, this, this is your... This is your jank. Everything over 16 milliseconds is your jank. And this is what users are going to notice, right? Because when you're over 16, like, you're, you ever notice when an app freezes, like, this, you're like, it doesn't respond to your input? Well, that's, like, that's the, that's the red in this diagram. Um, and the, <clears throat> something I'm not going to get into this talk, but uh, at DroidCon is, like, there's a big difference between having a lot of slow, like, slightly slow frames. So, like, you can see on this, like, the the left uh, the right side here is that these are these are frames that are only slightly over, and then all the way on the the left um, is a frame that took a really long time. I mean, which one do you, should you optimize first? I don't know. <clears throat> so it would be nice if you can just like optimize to say like all this slow work that I didn't 
want to do because it makes the user feel bad is just get rid of it, right? But it's not that easy, right? So, <clears throat> so basically, there are a few situations uh, that can put you over the 16 milliseconds. You're either doing unnecessary work on every frame. So if you just got rid of the unnecessary work, then you know you now you only have one slow frame. Or you can take uh, the work that you are doing on these slow frames and you can move it to other frames. Because like I said, if you're doing things, like if you finish rendering the frame before um, 16 milliseconds, it's just gonna sit there and wait. Um, I mean, maybe your other CPU cores are doing something, I don't know. Um, so basically now you have the same sort of like, you're under 16 the entire time and uh, the user's gonna have a nice smooth experience. <clears throat> so, let's take that same data again and render it a different way. Let's take the components that we just had. Uh, before, it was sorted in terms of from bottom to top in the order that they're done, right? Because you started with the start was the sort of teal color, and then the, the GPU work was the, the orange color. Um, so now we have that on the bottom. Um, so, if we arrange it this way, we can see that there's work that you pretty much have to do almost every single frame, um, or pretty much every frame. You, you, you have to draw the frame, you have to send it to the GPU, and the GPU has to render it. And there's no way, there's no way around this. Like, if you're not drawing, then like, what are you doing? I don't know, uh, on the UI thread. Uh, traversals, so you're doing measure and layout. You're not doing this on every frame because you're not always adding uh, view groups or, or views to your layout, right? So, so this is work that you can sort of uh, optimize, uh, and it's gonna. It can also cause jank when it's slow, <clears throat> and this is very infrequent work. Um, start, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, uh, and input and animations um, is like your. Like I said before, it's your inflate and your bind, and you're not inflating something on every single frame, right? Because you're not always adding. They're not always new new list items, and animations is what happens when the user stops touching the screen. Um, and that <clears throat> was what happens when, like, basically you, you stop scrolling and the, the screen's still moving a little bit, so like, maybe you'll have to inflate something new, I don't know. So I wrote a really, really tiny bash script, more like Python script, called Slicker. And basically what it does is that information that um, the uh, graphics info and frames apps dumps uh, into your, like, basically you can, you can dump it to your shell. Um, that information, uh, it, you only get 120 frames at a time, and I think most users scroll for more than two seconds at a time, right? So it's like 60 frames per second, um, and so 120 frames is only gonna be two seconds of scrolling. Maybe they scroll for like five minutes, I don't know. So you're gonna, so this is basically a script that goes and aggregates that data and combines it into a nice uh, table for you like this. Um, so here I only have 120 frames because I realized that if I displayed like 2,000 frames, it would be like, you wouldn't be able to see anything. But basically, uh, the middle is what you would normally get. Um, and then the bottom is like the sorted work, which is a nice way of visualizing, like I sh showed before, the 50th percentile, the um, uh, 95th percentile, the 99th percentile, uh, which is a good way of seeing how janky your app is. Um, and this Google Plus, for whatever reason, um, says the same thing, but a little bit bigger. Um, for whatever reason, they changed the colors between graphics info and uh, frame stats, and I don't know why. So the colors don't match the rest of my talk, which is kind of annoying. Um, cool. So, so this is what jank is, right? It, I think um, most of the time, jank comes from inflating and binding. Um, but also, when you inflate a new view, it has to go and do uh, the layout and measure pass as the draw, and then send that to the GPU. So basically, it's all very cumulative. Like you have to you do a little bit more in the beginning, and like cascades into a lot more work, and then you have like these frames that take like I don't know minutes. <laughs> um, so one thing that uh, Lisa was talking about is <clears throat> basically. You want to take, uh, you want to infl inflate as little as possible and bind as little as possible. Um, this way that uh, 
you don't end up in this situation where like you're inflating like I don't know I think it's 13 views I drew here. Uh, I think a rough um, rule of thumb is uh, it's like one millisecond per view or something like that if you're inflating. Um, so 13 will put you at 13 milliseconds, which you only have 16. So I don't know if you have any time to bind or do layout pass anymore. <laughs> um, so I don't know if Groupie helps with this, but you want to split that same set of views uh, across different items. So that way, on new frames, uh, it doesn't have to inflate and bind as much. So that way, the peaks that you see in that uh, in frame stats are going to be shorter, right? So here, we're in, at the bottom, we're inflating three views, so maybe that'll take three milliseconds. Uh, in the middle, we're inflating like, some larger number of views. But basically, you're trying to spread this work out. Um, and, and, and then this also means that if inflates faster, then bind, you're binding fewer things. Your, your layout and your measure pass is doing, doing less, and your draw is going to be doing less. Remember, like, the, the draw stuff is cached. So like, uh, if it's already drawn a view, and a view says, like, oh, I don't need to be drawn again, then it won't draw it again. So how do you do this? You use smaller view holders. On the left, we have two view holders. And the right, we have split those view holders up into smaller ones. Um, so you might notice here that I have more views than I had on the left side. Right? <clears throat> and, but one of the things that you have to think about is what if you now have, like, you're looking at three of them at the same time. Well, recycle view doesn't like you can only see like part of the the top one and the bottom one, but you still they're still in your uh, view hierarchy, right? They still exist, and recycle view doesn't have a way of like, oh, I'm just going to not render. Well, it's not going to render. It's not going to call draw necessarily, but uh, it still it still has to do the layout and the the measure pass on it, and you're still probably binding the data uh, in that part of the the view holder. So if you had smaller view holders, then that <clears throat> uh, then it has to bind less, and it has to lay out and measure less, and also has to draw less, which is pretty good for performance. So I have a brief little example here. Here, so I'm scrolling through the Tumblr app, and I'm scrolling for about seven seconds, um, which is not a lot of time. I mean, I hope you spend more than seven seconds on Tumblr. Um, or maybe if, maybe if you only spend seven seconds on Tumblr, you probably shouldn't tell me. Um, but that works out to like 18,000 pixels or something. That's crazy. Like I scrolled that far in seven milliseconds. And 18,000 pixels in seven seconds means per frame you have to render 14 dp. I mean, I, I mean it's, it's, it's unlikely that like here you're gonna just you're gonna display like you know, I don't know, a tenth of, of a picture. So don't do that. Right? Don't take an image view and split it up into 10 image views, because you're probably not going to end up any better. You're probably going to use this. I mean, your layout's going to take longer. Your measure's going to take longer. So there's a bit of a balance there. Um, but 14 DP is not a lot. And uh, compared to like how big your, your entire card in a, in a card view is, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to split up uh, all of your components that you're in your list to something so small. So it's obviously uh, something you have to balance, like how many views do you want to have, and also how making those views small so that inflate and bind are faster. Um, so there's also another component that I'm going to spend more time talking about at Droidcon, but basically scrolling is, is not, it's, it changes over time. Right. In the beginning, when you first open your recycle view, um, you're mostly inflating, right? You're spending a lot of time, like, none of these view exi views exist. I'm going to have to inflate all of them, have to call bind on all of them. But inflate is going to take the vast majority of your time because it takes longer to inflate than to bind. If it took less time, then I don't know why recycle view would exist. Um, but as you, get, as you get through maybe the middle of your list, or, or I don't know, maybe in one or two minutes, You've inflated a lot of the things that like the user is probably going to see, and you're spending a lot of time binding. Um, and near, there's no end, obviously. <laughs> a lot your your user can scroll infinitely, but for after a long amount of time, uh, you're going to have images, and those images uh, are no longer on the screen. And then GC needs to take that memory back at some point, 
So GC can go and like, I mean, if you have like a, a main thread GC, I mean, I don't know, it probably takes like 10 milliseconds or something, especially on, on older devices that are running Dolphic or something. Um, and that's just going to ruin your, your per frame performance. You're going to go over 16. And then on top of that, you're probably still binding. And you're probably still, it, it might even be likely that binding causes a GC because you, you, you called new inside bind. Or inflate can call, also cause G, GC because you're creating a new view, right? So then it just cascades, right? Uh, because now <clears throat> you, you create a, you're, you're binding something, you're inflating something, that's going to cause a layout pass and a measure pass and everything. So basically, the gist is do less work more often. Spread your work out through multiple frames. And this is all UI thread work, right? You're still, I mean, obviously, if you're doing things like background work, like networking, obviously, it should be on a, on a background thread. Um, but you can't help uh, creating new views because that's what the user sees. But if you create fewer views per frame, you bind fewer views per frame, then the user is going to have a smoother experience. Because now you don't have these sort of like micro stutters where the user is waiting for like uh, a second, basically, for, for something to happen on the screen. And the app's not responsive because the UI, the main thread is blocked. So this library, uh, github.com slicker. And that's my Twitter. I know. Any questions? Did I go too fast? question, sorry. Okay, um, I had to find Olivia's thing. Do you know off the top of your head? Okay. Um, closing announcements. Before party, more mingling. Well, I just have a dramatic reading. I don't know what's going on. Okay, uh, that was a header. So uh, see you at our October 19th meetup at Facebook. Um, again, live streaming tickets are still available which the code is Squarespace Meetup. Um, thanks again to Squarespace, our September sponsor. The after party is at Houston Hall. Um, we were going to like hang out here and then get sort of booted out at 9, but I don't know if that's happening. It seems, it seems like, it's like everything's quieted right down. So, <laughs> Oh, cool. So we're going to hang out here until 9. I suggest all of you that are planning to hang out to hang out here until 9, and then we'll just see how Houston Hall happens. All right, well, thanks for coming out. Get ready for next week. It's going to be uh, a lot of talks. One more thing. Oh. Thank you. All right. Who's. Uh, is, is there music? That would be awesome. Cool. All right, good. <laughs>